hopefully you are here for B13 training. We muted you when you came in. Um, we do have lots of chat, chat box check-ins as we go through. Um, so we will make sure to get to any questions that you may have. Oh, here's Titus, awesome. Okay, so we are doing transition planning specific to the B13 indicator. Um, my name is Leora Byrus. I am a member of the Federal General Supervision and Monitoring Team, and I've gotten ahead of myself because I get all excited. So before I get ahead of myself again, please take a moment and make sure that your name is correct in the chat box. It makes it a little bit easier for us. Um, and we like to know who we're talking to first, but we also keep track of districts you attend uh, because as you get into cohort, there are different requirements for training, et cetera. And we're doing some pre-training and we want to keep track of what districts have, um, have attended. So, oh, excellent. We're down to one Lisa Cromwell. Thank you very much. We appreciate that. All right. Um, go on. So we're going to do introductions in just a second. Uh, we're going to go over the purpose of the training today. We're going to go through the B13 indicator. As we go through the indicator, we will um, show you examples of each component of the transition plan, um, a, a compliant version of it, and we'll make sure to answer any questions as we go through. So this is who we are. We're the um, general supervision and monitoring team. Colette, do you want to come on and say hello? Hey, my name is Colette Sullivan. I'm the federal programs coordinator. Nice to see you all. Thanks for joining us. Um, I'm Leora Byrus. Carly, you want to say hello? Yeah, hi, I'm Carly Thibodeau, one of the special education consultants on the team. We also have Julie. Hi, I'm Julie Pelletier, admin support for the monitoring team. All right, poor Jennifer is not with us right now. She had some tech difficulties earlier working on the website. And our special guest today, we are so excited to have Titus O'Rourke with us. Titus, you want to come, come on and say hello? Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Titus O'Rourke, and I am the transition specialist with the Office of Special Services and Inclusive Education. Thank you very much. Sorry, I'm just writing myself a little note. I found three typos when we because we did this session this morning too. So I have a sticky on my desk so I can write down the slide numbers because I couldn't find them, of course, when I wanted to fix them. So uh, if you see them before I do, put them in the chat box for me. <laughs> um, okay, so Carly should have put in the procedural manual for you. Um, we are gonna be talking about the B13 indicator today, specific to transition planning. Um, we're gonna be talking about the advanced written notice, section nine of the IEP and a written notice. And that's where you can find that information in the procedural manual. And just a reminder that if you are someone who teaches um, seniors or, or students who are um, leaving your district, either graduating or um, uh, aging out to you know, 22, then you also would have to do a summary of performance document, which is on pages 82 to 85. That's a required document under IDEA. Um, graduating or leaving high school seniors get them. So don't forget about that document as well when we're talking about um, transition planning. So Muser should be in the chat box as well. And there are lots of references to Muser, the main unified special education regulation. These are all the references to secondary transition. Um, okay, I think of one more thing. So this is the administrative letter that went out on 12121 that extended eligibility to FAPE until age 22. So MUSER has not been updated yet, so it's not yet in statute. However, um, I believe that most districts, if not all districts in Maine are following the administrative letter. Um, so if you wanna look up the letter, there it is. So there's some frequently asked questions as we go through slides today. Uh, we're gonna talk about what if you don't know the child, um, it's a ninth grader, 
they just came into your classroom in September and they have an annual in September? How do you write a transition plan for a student that you don't know? I'm going to answer that for you. Um, what if the child wants to be something very lofty, like a rock star or a supermodel or something that not very many people get to be? Um, why you shouldn't name specific colleges or businesses in a transition plan? Should you include parents in 9F? And what to do if the parents don't want to encourage the child to consider employment? We'll have some things to talk about that as well. So this is the IDEA Part B indicator. There are actually 20 different pieces of the whole thing. So you know that IDEA Part B is, um, you know, was looking at special education specifically um, for students three to uh, 22 now uh, for, for us. So our team specifically looks at indicator 13. We look at indicator 11. We look at 10. We look at four. Um, and I think that's it. Titus, who is with us, as you know, does a lot with indicator one, which is graduation rates, indicator two, which are dropout rates, and indicator 14, which are post-school outcomes. And one of the points that we really wanted to include today is that good B13 planning and data collection will help with the B1 graduation indicator and the B2 dropout indicator. And it also could help improve the B14 post-secondary outcome. So we really just wanted to point out that the indicators work together in, in, in some instances. And this is a really good example of those, um, you know, four indicators can really influence the other and sort of the baseline of that is B13 planning. So one more thing that I wanted you to know before we kind of get into the meat of things is that if you have transition findings on a corrective action plan, um, you have to close those within one year of the cap being issued. If for some reason those TRA findings are not closed, we have to report the number of days over a year to OSAP because that is the federal indicator. So um, if you're, it's, it's, it's just really important to make sure that as you're doing your transition planning, you're not um, missing pieces of the indicator, that they're complete. And we're gonna go through those all in very great detail. So Titus, do you wanna come on and talk about the meaningful day piece and what that all entails? So when speaking to Meaningful Day, we need to realize that our scholars um, should be active community members um, to ensure that their, um, their goals support their purposeful transition and um, purposeful engagement within the community. And that is why uh, we are highlighting uh, meaningful day, not not what it means for us, but what me what is meaningful for the student, right? What what are how will they engage to um, be a uh, respectful citizenship? So, for example, if we look at civics, we're looking at um, to vote making them realize that they are active members of their community and they, and they can contribute purposefully. And I repeat this word, I know, but it has to be purposeful and meaningful to your student. Perfect, thank you, Titus. Mm -hmm. So that's the tone that we're really setting today. We want this whole process to be meaningful for the student. And we also want it to be a thoughtful process for you as well as you write these plans with your student and as you guide them into student-centered planning. Um, because we know that time is a premium, especially now with the effects of COVID and staffing and all those types of things. So we, we don't want you to spend time just filling in the blanks right before the IEP um, for the transition plan. We want to um, give you the tools and the resources 
to have the process be thoughtful for, for both of you who are involved in, the, in this, you and the student, because you're really the people who are gonna teach them um, about that student-centered planning through this process. So some guiding questions as we go through today, what is it that you're actually doing to support the student? What assessments are being used? How are you applying the results, right? Because the results don't mean anything unless you use them to guide you. Are the activities and services meaningful? And what are you doing? Will what you're doing really help the student to achieve their goals and to enjoy a good quality of life and a meaningful day? Um, those are those are what's guiding us right now. So we also are including some self-determination slides in the very beginning today. Um, and I should have prefaced, we have a whole bunch of resources at the end. And sometimes I go through those and give lots of detail about them. We're not gonna do that this afternoon, which is a little bit different. And it's because we wanna make sure that we have enough time to really be thoughtful about all of our other slides. So when we get to the online resources piece, I'm just gonna fly through those and just know that they are very thoughtfully placed um, in our PD to be helpful for you in the classroom and to be able to access resources without spending money on them and, and um, to be able to just print things off the internet and have them. So that's, the, that's about the resources at the end that I forgot to say in the beginning. Okay, so. Promoting self-determination in youth and disabilities. Uh, that's number, okay, so it should be tips for families and professionals, and this is slide 18. So let me just make a note because as I said, I couldn't remember where my typos were, and there's one. So we really want to help the student learn how to make choices, to know that you know their interests are important and we want whatever their interests are to be reflected in the transition plan that we're doing. We want to give them um, information about their disability. We wanna speak directly to them, um, prepare them for meetings. We need the students to be present at their meetings so it's their voice that is heard. Um, there's a few more slides with this particular resource Titus, is there anything that you want to add to the choice making piece of this? I know that's really, really important to you. <laughs> yes. So, <laughs> so promoting self um, determination in youth and disabilities and tops for families and professionals, we have to realize that um, it is important not to keep our kid in this bubble right, where everybody is supporting the kid, but the kid, our scholar, right, with their significant needs has to be fully part of that decision making. They have to be leading their meetings. And the earlier we start um, developing their self-advocacy and self-determination skills, the, um, the increased um, opportunity for post-secondary success is developed for them. So um, trying to ensure when they come in at ninth grade or 16 years old or earlier as appropriate, that we are speaking and encouraging them to participate in the IEP meeting. This is one strength that will guide their, not only their high, sc high school experience, but their post-secondary opportunities as well, if they participate in the deci decision-making, because it's their voice and their choice. So um, these are for us as adults to realize that we shouldn't sh um, we shouldn't be telling our students what they need to do. We need to be guided, but what the students strengths preference interests and needs are and we can only do that is when we encourage and secure our students um, uh, attending and participating at the IEP meeting. Awesome thank you Titus. Mm -hmm. I am going to go right to this one because the promoting of reasonable risk-taking is one that really resonates 
with me as a former teacher. We mm -hmm. wrap our kids in bubble wrap sometimes. And when we do that, we don't give them the opportunity to learn to problem solve or to deal with the natural consequences of something that happened, whether you know negative or positive. And those are lessons that our kids need to learn. So being able to help them take reasonable risks to, so that they can develop those problem solving skills. Um, and it could be that, you know, you're, you're making choice maps with listing the risk with them, you know, the pros and the cons, the benefits and consequences, what does that really mean? But allowing them to make mistakes and, and problem solve that, you're going to be right there to help them but they need to learn that piece and, and reasonable risk-taking is, is one way that we can help them with that. So another couple of pieces of information about the self-determination is to encourage problem solving. We talked about that. Promoting self-advocacy, that's really what we've been talking about since the beginning. And you'll notice that many of the resources at the end that I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on are about self-advocacy, their curriculum, um, lessons, some are set up very um, uh, de in a detail way, Other, others are not, but they're all accessible on the internet. Um, and you can use those to teach the kids self-advocacy, self-determination skills, how to problem solve. And then there's only one more slide after this to talk about it, but facilitate development of self-esteem. Um, you know, when I think about the assessment piece, which we're gonna spend a lot of time on because it really just drives so much of the transition plan. Um, mm -hmm. I think about, you know, when you're filling out an interest inventory or your strengths and weaknesses or something like that, how exciting it is to find out that you're good at something that you didn't realize that you're good at. And so helping our kids do that too, and, you know, showing them that, you know, you didn't realize that this was a, this was a strength for you, here we go, that's awesome. That is so helpful to their self-esteem. Um, but also, we spend so much time with them, right? We spend so much time with our students. We really need to try to model that sense of, of positive self-esteem and positive self-confidence so that we can teach them by example as well, because you're very likely the people that they're spending arguably the most time with during any given week. And then helping youth understand their disabilities. There's another resource at the end that's about, it's an IEP sort of notebook that the kids can fill out with information. Um, and it, 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 really in, in, um, it really asks for folks, for the child to really reflect on what does it mean to have a disability? What kind of disability do you have? What accommodations help you be successful? What are you really good at? So not, um, not sort of keeping it under the rug because the kids know that they have a disability, but really just putting it right out there and talking to them about it and, and involving them in that process. Right, is anything you wanna? And adding to this idea of um, understanding their disabilities, we also have to know that in a group setting, a, um, a scholar might not feel as comfortable sharing. So making sure that you know your student and that you're addressing this um, on, in a platform, in a setting that is uh, most comfortable for them to be able to do so. So um, be very cognizant on what information you share um, in a whole group versus one-on-one -on -one with that student. And we do know that that IEP meeting only comes once a year and it's so difficult um, to find one-on-one -on -one time with the student. But creating opportunities like that throughout the year will help you check in with the student, but also have the student check in with you as far as um, discussing their disabilities and needs. Um, a conversation that you can use to support understanding of their disabilities would be speaking about assistive technology. Hey, I see that you having you need more time um, to write your essay or whatever the impact it is for the student to produce their work. So discussing assistive technology, uh, ways to use Google 
uh, docs, ways to use graphic organizers, all of these things as part of the learning process, but also an opportunity to discuss um, how the what what they need to be successful versus just using the word disability. So framing it in a way that can empower the student versus having the student feel othered by using the word your disability is this versus speaking to if you use this tool, you'll find more success in, you know, addressing whatever the learning need or objective is in, in that sense. So be very, be very careful and mindful of the language you use when discussing um, the disability with your student. Awesome. Thank you, Titus. Um, I'm not seeing anything in the chat box. So we're going to go right on to the indicator itself. We're going to get into section nine of the IEP. Um, before we do that, I want to talk about each individual component and why the P13 indicator itself is so frustrating sometimes. Mm -hmm. So all of these pieces of the indicator have to be 100% compliant in order for the transition plan to be compliant. So we look in the advance written notice for the purpose of the meeting. We look to make sure that that checkbox about post-secondary transition is checked off on that. Then we look on the advance written notice to make sure that the child is invited to the meeting. Um, best practice would be to include the child in the salutation. Some districts send these students their own advance written notice, and that's perfectly fine. Um, minimally compliant is to include the child on the list of people being invited on the back, but we really believe best practice is for the child to be included in the citation since the meeting is all about the child and their goals and needs. Um, we look in section 9G of the IEP to see if there are any agencies that the district invited to participate as part of the planning. And if the answer is yes, then we look to make sure that there is a parental consent to invite that outside agency um, to the transition discussion table. Please do not leave 9G blank. I can't tell you how many times we have gone through transition plans and they have been so well written, just robust and aligned and you know, multiple years and it looks fantastic. And then we get to 9G and it's blank. And we have to say 0%. And it literally sometimes brings me almost to tears because I know how much work that someone put into that document. So please just don't leave 9G blank. We'll remind you again when we get to that section, don't worry. Um, we also look in the written notice to make sure that if that person is invited by the district, there's a note about it. We look in the written notice to make sure that there's a discussion about the post-secondary goals and that they're updated annually. We look in 9B of the IEP to, to look for assessments. We look in 9G to make sure there are goals about, um, pardon me, that there are goals about education training, post-secondary employment, and post-secondary goals in independent living. We also look back to section five and make sure that there's language in at least one goal that aligns the goals in section nine to section five. And we have some examples to show you um, to use existing goals so that you're not reinventing the wheel. Um, independent living is a section of nine that can be NA. It's one of only two sections. So if you, for instance, have a child you know, who has SLD in math, for instance, and doesn't have functional needs, you can put NA there. Um, course of study is in 9E, and then transition services in 9F. And don't worry, I will say this 300 times when we get there, but 9F should not be child will statement. Because if you look at the prompt on, on the IEP, it says the activity is provided by the adults in the school and the community. But that's why they're not child will. Don't worry. Mm -hmm. We're going to have more information on that. Mm -hmm. So when we get to section three of the IEP, this is where it prompts you, does this child have a transition plan or not? Are they over? Um, are they 16 or older? Are they ninth grade or over? If the answer is yes, 
the transition plan should inform the rest of the document. That's how important post-secondary outcomes are. So that's really um, best practice would be to go to the transition plan and look through that before you get to the other sections of the IEP to make sure that that transition plan, again, because it's student driven, is informing the rest of the IEP. Mm -hmm. And this is just a reminder, ITEA says that transition planning starts at age 16. Muser Maine Unified Special Education goes above and beyond, which is really awesome. You guys live in a state that cares so much about their students with disabilities that we go a full two years, if not more earlier, to start that transition planning, which is really awesome. Um, so if you have a ninth grader or older, perfect. Now, what do you do if the child comes into your classroom in September and they're a ninth grader, they need a transition plan and you don't know them and they have an IEP in five days. So what you can do is make sure the rest of the IEP is updated, which will be challenging, but you know, you've been there before. For the transition piece, you can propose at the IEP meeting that you meet by the end of the year, say May, right, April, May, and that you will work on doing assessments with the child and working on the transition plan, goal setting, et cetera, between September and then, and then you'll amend the IEP and add the transition plan in at that later meeting. So as long as the transition plan is part of the IEP by the end of ninth grade, then you will be in compliance and you will have a lot of time for that meaningful interaction to um, help guide the process um, with the student. All right, let's see. Um, so post-secondary plans are only for students with a disability. However, research is showing us that planning earlier than ninth grade has better post-secondary outcomes for students with disabilities. So even, you know, starting in middle school, you know, looking at different things. My, my um, goddaughter is in fifth grade and she has, oh my gosh, I always forget the name of it, but she has a class at her school. I think it's called advisor or guidance, guidance maybe. Um, and so, and she's been doing this class for a couple of years and right now they're on problem solving. So this is a general education class that is happening in elementary school to really look at how do we teach the kids to problem solve and things like that. So if she were older taking that class and she had a disability, I would wanna make sure that that class is in her IEP. So don't forget about general education classes that work on life skills and so on that you can add to the IEP as Do you, Titus, do you have anything you wanna say about that piece? Oh, no, you could have. Yeah. Okay, perfect. I just want to make sure I'm not forgetting you. All right. So if you think you have a student who is going to need an extra year or two of high school, that planning should start as early as possible. Um, it's really important that the IEP team discusses that and um, documents that discussion in the written notice very clearly as soon as possible so that... Mm -hmm. Titus, is that you? Did you have something to add? Yes, I was. I was okay. just thinking regarding the um, transition and whether it is appropriate for the um, team to consider adding a fifth or sixth year to the student's IEP. So this is the part making sure that we highlight um, in the written notice um, to the parent that this was discussed and that you are reviewing um, the needs of the student past the fourth year. For example, if the, the student has um, a lot of complex needs and they might have to uh, focus on ELA, um, uh, English and history one semester or maybe um, in one year creative programming based on the students, right? So, and they might not complete all their credits in the ninth year based on 
their um on their ability to access their curriculum. Sometimes it has to be repeated and repeated for the student to find success. So really looking individualized at that particular student and their program and their needs, what is most appropriate for the student to complete the, the credits, their functional skills, and their transition? Will a four-year um, graduation Outlook, support the student in accessing and being successful academically, functionally, and within transition? Or should we consider ninth grade on what that uh, his program will look like? Will it look like a five-year program or six-year program? So very cognizant of, number one, the student's levels, right? Knowing their levels and their capacity to learn. And number two, making sure that it's detailed in your written notice that you are discussing this with the parent. Because we don't want parents to come back to us in year four and go, hey, um, I want my student to stay until age 22. So the earlier we start developing the course of study and making sure that you have it in the written notice as your backup. Like we didn't discuss this, but there's the written notice that was sent to you discussing the plan, discussing the plan of study, the course of study across these various years. Do we have any questions for that? There's nothing in the chat box. So hopefully that means that people are already focusing on all this and <laughs> all right. So as you know, we're all former educators on this team. So we love visuals. So this is an end, this came out of an intact um, resource the National Technical Assistance Center on Transition, the collaborative. They are a group that we belong to that focuses on transition and they do PD, they've got toolkits, they, they're fantastic. So this is a resource that they use and I love the fact that the student focused planning and the family engagement is at the top because we know that arguably those pieces are you know, among the most important part of the process, right? Um, there's also what are the program structures? Uh, what it, what if the child, for instance, is going to stay an extended year or two in high school? What is that programming going to look like for them? Um, Interagency collaboration. What other agencies are working with that student? Are they at the table? Is everybody on the same page and sharing information about students? And then student development, assessment, what are their academic skills, student supports, et cetera. Um, those are, the assessment piece especially is something that you are going to play a big part in with that particular student. So this is the section nine of the transition plan. I just wanted to put a picture of it. So you can see it's not even the whole thing. It only goes down to 9E. Um, when we talked about the advanced written notice, best practice, dear mom, dad, and Bobby, the child, it's very clear that the child has been invited to their meeting. Um, so you can write in the salutation. There's no ambiguity there. Um, 9A is the projected date of graduation. If a student becomes credit deficient or if the IEP team um, decides that the child should have, um, you know, an extra year or two of high school, that date can change. So the, the date of graduation is not set in stone. So when you first do a transition plan, you might just put in, you know, June and then the year, just count out four years. And then as you progress, you can adjust that date of graduation if it's needed. Okay, so this talks about graduation. Um, this is what it looks like on a compliant IEP 9A, June of 2022. I don't see anything in the chat box. So we're gonna go on to assessment. We're gonna spend some time on assessment because assessment is hugely important to this whole process, right? It really is where 
we get the student driven part done and get that information. So it should be ongoing and cumulative. It shouldn't be just once a year right before the annual. Um, it should be individualized. It might be that you like an assessment, a basic assessment, and you start all of your kids with that one basic assessment, and that's perfectly fine. But that assessment should drive what you look at next with that student. So it would be surprising to see sort of a, a prescription of assessments to for every st single student being the same um, because it should be an individualized process. Um, the process should be based on the student's strengths, needs, interests, and goals. This is where we're gonna get that information and use it to explore other assessments that might give us more detail and information. Um, it should increase the student's self-awareness. They should learn how to self-advocate because they're gonna tell you, yeah, I like that. No, I don't like this. They're going to learn that process. Um, and it should be used to develop the appropriate annual and post-secondary goals. So what we're not going to do is just do the assessments and leave it. Like the information that you get, you should use because it's, it's a process and it's a time-consuming process. Um, so the other piece that I want to make sure before I ask Titus for her input is that this assessment process is not only the responsibility of the special education teacher. There are other people on the team who may be able to or may be in positions like related service providers um, to do different assessments or to give you more information as well. And don't forget the general education curriculum as well. Like I talked about with um, my goddaughters, you know, she takes this guidance class, and that is a class that talks about transition and functional life skills. So I would want to make sure that that was included um, in section nine of her IEP. Mm -hmm. And we can talk about transition assessment, and we can talk about informal and formal assessments. Um, it is not about handing a student a piece of paper and having them answer the, the questions. What it is is really engaging the student to think about their uh, preferences and how that will inform their post-secondary goals. So we know, even as adults, if we were asked um, to speak, us, uh, speak about ourselves in a very formal construct, we would, re, uh, uh, um, we would share differently than if two colleagues were sitting on you know, a bench outside and having a conversation. And so too, we need to think about the point of view of the student. If in a formal setting, you know the, the student won't open up as much versus just going into the cafeteria or maybe taking a walk and sitting on a bench um, to try and gain information regarding their spin, their strengths, preferences, um, and needs, interests and needs. Um, additionally, a transition assessment, as uh, Leora was speaking to, you, the, the, the case manager, right, the special education teacher is not necessarily the only person that can um, have the student engage in a transition assessment. If you know that your student likes science, right, maybe you can work with the science teacher um, and find out the information that the student had shared with their favorite teacher, the science teacher. And you might have a different view of who that student is in your class versus um, with another teacher or gym class or coach. They, the student has will respond differently to different teachers. And so being able to use your IEP team in support of accessing the transition information, it will be more authentic that way versus just having the student um, sit and complete that. The next thing that I also want us to um, focus on is uh, the level of that transition assessment. Is the student, um, if we're speaking about a student with a uh, complex needs, maybe having to uh, find a different assessment tool that includes maybe pictures, right? So that the student is able to access this 
independently or with support, but it also speaks to how the student can access that information so that they can truly share their spin, their strengths, their preferences, interests, and needs um, in that way because that assessment tool is accessible to that student. Yes, so thank you, Liara. Of course. Mm -hmm. So this really speaks to what Titus was just, you know, talking about is making sure that as we go through the assessment process, that we know whose needs are being met, that we share that information with the student and the family. We have that information recorded and we do something with it. It helps us drive what we're doing with, um, with the student. Um, so for student focused transition planning, this is a graphic that really talks about what to assess if you're looking to have true student-focused transition planning. So helping them learn their learning styles, um, assessing what their social skills are, um, communication, interpersonal, can they um, have a conversation? Can they ask questions if they need help? What are their independent living skills? And don't forget that even kids who don't have disabilities may need to learn independent living skills. Um, what kind of supports and accommodations does the student need to have to be successful, including AT, as Titus already talked about? Um, vocational and occupational skills, self-advocacy, what are their interests and preferences? What are their aptitudes? Uh, what's their personality, temperament and personality? And, you know, I've, I did some personality stuff with my students over the years, and they always always had a lot of fun with that piece, you know? So this stuff can be really fun for the students, um, and it, it can really show them who they are, who they want to be, and how they can get there. And you, you're hugely important to that. So some acceptable transition assessments SATs, PSATs, ASVABs, ACCUPLACERS, those are all, they all have transition components or are specific. Some assessments that your students may be taking that don't have transition components, NUIAs, MEAs, the WISC, Wyatt's, Woodcock, Johnson, um, any curriculum-based measures, those generally speaking do not have transition components, so we would not include those in 9B of the IEP. Some things to include, informal student interview. Um, you can't really go, I don't think, I don't think you could do anything other than that to be compliant. Like that's sort of the, the lowest one you can do is to sit down and talk with the kid um, and have that informal student interview. Not to say it's not important because it certainly is. That can tell you what you want to do next. Do you want to look at their academic skills? Do you want to do career in this inventory, et cetera? Um, but just uh, career vocational interest and skills, those self-determination skills. So what we don't want to do is just stick with the informal student interview and, and stay there. We want to help. We want to have the student help us from there um, to pick out other assessments that will be helpful for them. We also want to make sure that we are not using the same tool over and over every single year. We have to make sure that we are trying to access um, authentic um, information to help us uh, develop that IEP, but most importantly, support that student. So making sure that um, that transition assessment is number one, appropriate, and number two, accessible. And three, that we are not repeating the same assessment for each student, because um, um, some students might be further than others. Some might have to be guided on really developing their self-determination and self-advocacy skills, whereas others um, would maybe be a very functional need on how on how to uh, get up and get dressed and or uh, time management. So being very specific of as to what transition assessment is being used um, to gather data to inform that IEP. So we got a great question in the chat box from Molly. Would the fact that juniors and seniors attend a career in tech school in a career trade, 
So you, you would list, if they're doing assessments as part of that career in tech school, then yes, you would list the assessments here. So that would really speak to having, um, you know, a good communication line with whoever their teachers are, you know, doing that career in tech school. Um, but you would list their involvement in the career in tech school in 9F of the IEP. And we'll we'll get to that in a little bit because you that obviously is huge for them for functional life skills. So you want to make sure that's in the service section. Including inviting that CTE me, um, teacher yes. to the um, actual IEP meeting. That is part of the IEP team, making sure as well, because we have to do progress monitoring. So make sure that you are, um, that you know who that teacher is and that you can um, uh, forward the dates that you will need the information to support updating your progress monitoring. So having that conversation early and making sure that that CTE teacher remains involved um, throughout the year or years that the student is participating in that CTE program. All right. So when, what do you do with the transition assessment information? Our guidance is to put a sentence or two in 4A with the rest of the assessment information. I'm gonna show you an example in just a minute, but this isn't required, but it is best practice because it shows movement towards, towards those post-secondary goals and it shows the details that you are getting with those assessments. Um, if you, if David Emberly, um, he does some talks here and there about transition specific to due process. And one of the things that he says in every one that I have attended of his with transition pieces is that due process with transition um, is almost always connected to like a stale plan, like, you know, the informal student interview every year and then the bare minimum of, um, you know, what is compliant. Transition plans that don't end up in due process are the ones that show progress. So they show progress and they show movement. That's really the key there is showing movement. So just putting in a blurb in section 4A can really help with that. So this is from the procedural manual and it talks about, um, you know, transition assessments. So um, there's just a couple of slides of those, and I'm not going to go in them in great detail because you can you can do that. Um, but here we have an example of 9B. So there was an informal student interview in 2020. There was a career interest inventory in 2021, a classroom observation in 2021. And then this is what I was talking about. You'll see that each of the um, each of the assessments completed on the previous slide, are there's just like two sentences about each of them added to section four with all of the ev other ev evaluative information. So if I just look at uh, January of 2021, the career interest inventory, the results show that Dan enjoys hands-on projects and is good with technology. This supports his continued exploration of marketing and carpentry. So just a couple of sentences um, and then you know, you're, you're showing movement. I don't see anything new in the chat box. Mm -hmm. Okay, so before we, is there anything else you want to say on assessment before we move on to 9C? Okay, perfect. So 9C is the part of section nine where you say that the child attended or didn't attend their meeting. And here's an example. So Dan attended his meeting, perfect. Or Dan chose not to attend his IEP meeting. He met with his teacher on 515 to talk about his post-secondary interests and preferences. So important to note that the, the teacher should have met with Dan prior to the meeting if, if the child is not attending to make sure that their interests and preferences are being discussed. So attending a meeting, I know, is a pretty important thing to you, Titus. Do you want to add your thoughts on the importance of students attending? So we speak about self-advocacy and self-determination. And I know that um, 
this has been a push in the last few years. And we see our students in the 11th and 12th grade really grappling with the self-advocacy and self-determination. But the earlier we start with getting our students ready to participate in the IEP me meeting, the, 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 um, the more opportunity for success um, as they engage and direct um, what services and supports that they need. So I would encourage all our special education teachers for grade nine and 10 to start really looking at um, opportunities for them to grapple with self-determination and advocacy and also lean into how important it is for them to have a voice and their choice at the IEP meetings. Thank you. All right, 9D. Um, so this is where we're going to talk about the education training goal, the employment goal, and independent living skill goal when appropriate. So 9D documents the formal or informal training the child will receive after high school that enables them to make progress towards their career. And this is a will statement. When we get into 9F, we're not using will statements, but here we are. Mm -hmm. So here's four different examples with four different kids. After graduation, Dan will attend a four-year college or university to study marketing or receive on-the-job training to become a carpenter. After graduation, Dylan will attend a community college and study sports facility management. After graduation, Brooke will attend a post-secondary institution for marine biology and zoology. And after high school, Roy will receive on-the-job training in a pet store or a farm. So why did we not name that Dan will attend Colby College? Because we encourage you to be generically specific. And what we mean by that goes back to some due process stuff, that there have been places, not in Maine, thank goodness, where districts have said Dan will attend Colby College. And then Dan doesn't get accepted to Colby, Colby College and Dan's parents aren't very happy about it and go back to the district and say, wait a second, I have this document where you said my son was going to attend Colby College. And that just raises so many problems that nobody has time for, right? So the generically specific piece there's, there's how to get around that. It's a four-year college or university or a community college, a post-secondary institution. If we were talking about um, employment, instead of saying, you know, that Dan will get a job at Duncan, it would be Dan will get a job at a fast food restaurant. So again, generically specific. So what do we do about employment in 9D? We take the education and training goal and we make a statement about employment. So those should be in direct alignment. So after graduation, Dan will work in the field of marketing or carpenter or carpentry. Um, Dylan will be employed as a sports facility manager. Brooke will be employed as a marine biologist or zoologist. And Roy will be employed in a pet store or on a farm. So we're going to talk about what if the child wants to be something like a supermodel or a rock star or um, the example that I always use and forgive me if you've heard it 700 times is when I taught high school I had a student who was identified with intellectual disability who wanted to be a veterinarian. Her mother was a veterinarian um, and she you know saw all the good that her mom did and that's what she wanted to do. There was never a time in that process that I was like, hey, you have this intellectual disability, probably veterinary school is going to be really tough. But who wants to say that? You know, like, I don't want to break her little heart, right? So what did we do? We explored that career and what skills she would need and how long she would have to go to school and all of those types of things. And we explored the whole field. We took her to um, the Androscoggin Humane Society and she volunteered there like once a week for quite some time. We took her to the Maine Association for Prevention of Cruelty with Animals. They're the place in Wyndham that have the rescue horses. We would go down there once a week for quite some time. So she got experience working with horses. So we explored anything that we possibly could. And then she realized that maybe being a dog groomer was really sort of where her interest laid. So 
you know, she's in the same field, but she's doing something that she feels really proud of and she's really good at. Um, so that's how we explored that process. And she was able to see, I don't want to go to school for that long. Like, I don't, I don't want to have to take all these science classes and things like that. So she was able to come to that realization with our guidance. Um, so that's what we encourage you to do. Explore the field that the child is interested in. See what other jobs, um, you know, might be available in that that might be a little bit more accessible or attainable for your student. I exactly. know. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Looking at career clusters is um, what I would propose, as well as there's a tool called Career One Stop. Um, it has between 20 and 30 questions, which I know is a lot. But once you complete that tool, the student will be able to see all the jobs, the job description, and the um, learning requirements, like, for example, if there's training available or if they have to go to university or do a two year program. This is what Career One Stop, that tool will support the student in deciding. So if we were um, if we were speaking, I had this uh, student that wanted to be an EMT, but um, he wasn't able to participate in post-secondary um, education that would lead him to this employment goal. But what we did find was that they are, um, the EMTs have to uh, pack their vans and the ambulance, and there is supports needed at the actual um, depot that the ambulances go to. And so we had students actually working at the site, and they realized that there are more opportunities than just EMT um, being with the ambulance, which they wanted to drive all day. But there's maintenance of these um, these uh, uh, not cars, vehicles as well. And so it might not be directly what the student had professed they want to do as a career, but it can be related. And that's why make sure that we are thinking around career clusters versus just one job and one title for that particular position. And Career One Stop is actually one of the resources that is shared at the end under the online resources section. So there's a link um, directly to it and there's a picture of the dashboard. So, Ooh. additionally, once um, what the student has to put in their email and they can put in your email and that um, Career One Stop uh, uh, as they do that inventory, that assessment is then a PDF that you could upload and keep as well. So it's not just looking at the screen and there it is, but you can actually have that transition assessment either sent directly to you or have it sent to the student to forward to you so that they can have a copy of it as well. That's fantastic. So when we talk about independent living, some, some um, independent living skills are hygiene, budgeting, bills, and then how to access support services. But just keep in mind that these are, these are skills that should be considered with all students, um, all of our students, not just the students with disabilities or significant cognitive disabilities. Um, and, you know, if you think about it, you know, there's a general age in, in you know, early to mid teenage <laughs> years where most kids don't have the best hygiene. Like it's sort of age appropriate or expected at those times, right? Or most kids don't know how to budget, you know, they get their $10 or whatever. So these are things that we should be thinking about with all students um, <laughs> to make sure that they have that information. And with independent living, I also want to add that we also have to look at the, stu the student's um, health. Mm -hmm. So doing a health is assessment, especially as the student, like the 11th and 12th grade year earlier, as appropriate. But what medications are they taking? Who is the doctor that prescribes this medication? Obviously, you don't want to put that in the IEP, but you want to make sure that the student know, is aware of the support services that they have, how to contact them. What's, what's the regimen for 
using their pump versus the um, insulin, et cetera. And these are very important independent living skills that the student will need post-graduation. So having them be cognizant and, and, and using this information already, for example, if they're on prescription um, um, medication, how often do they have to refill it? How often do they have to take it? Uh, when should they start figuring out when to refill the prescription? Where do they go? How to fill in a, a prescription as well? Because when we're thinking about students age 17 doing age of majority, that means they'll start taking on that responsibility as well. So tying that to becoming an adult, being responsible for your health care. Thank you. Very, very important. You know, and I, I just want to piggyback one thing. Don't forget, and I know I already said this, that the special education teachers are not the only people responsible for this. So if you have a speech path who's working on functional communication, or you have an OT that's working on some of those functional skills as well, have conversations, you know, are there things that you could ask them to do as part of that time that would help with the transition planning? Or are they already doing things that you can include in the transition plan um, as services that um, that are happening already that aren't documented? Mm -hmm. I just want to add one more thing. When we start to, uh, when we think of budgeting as well, we can easily partner with the math teacher, right? Because all skill, all students need um, budgeting um, experience. So, if we're talking about budgeting. Um, transportation, right? How to plan for transportation costs, how to start planning for your food for the month, um, looking at how to not only what your bills are, but how to pay that, how to go online, how to look at information so that you can include it in your budgeting um, assignment. So you don't have to go with, go with go it alone. You can always lean into your general education um, uh, peers and ask them how to develop right, uh, a unit that could speak to developing your budget, how to find an apartment, how to plan uh, your bus routes, all of this. It, it, it does not just fall on your shoulders. It is an IEP team that develops and support the student throughout their high school career. And, and consider asking people to come in and talk about those jobs. You know, your school probably has a nutritionist that works with your your kitchens to plan menus. Ask if they if the nutritionist wants to come in for a period and talk about you know, the food pyramid, um, mm -hmm. personal finance classes. Yep. You, you, uh, yes. You would put them in nine F mm -hmm. um, the services. Yep. And some banks have programs for learning how to budget and so on. So you can get curriculum or guest speakers in to help out with that, those things as well. Mm -hmm. And I also want to mention that, um, the one bank account that is really important for our students and our families to know about is the ABLE accounts. Mm. And I think that is Bango Savings. Yeah. So when you're thinking of family engagement um, and just looking at budgeting, that is one way of including um, the bank or a representative from the bank um, to speak to how the ABLE account can support your student post-secondary. And we need to remember, to, I'm going to actually write a note. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, because we need to actually include that information in this ditus. Mm -hmm. All right. And if I don't write it down, it won't happen. Okay. So here are some examples of um, independent living goals. So after graduation, Dan will access, access mental health supports independently or with assistance from parents. Um, or he'll manage a budget independently or with assistance of parents, or boy will sim live semi-independently with a roommate in an assisted living apartment with support. Um, and don't forget, this is the only, only the second of two places where you can put an A if you don't want to have daily living goals, mm -hmm. or the team doesn't feel that the um, independent living goals are necessary for that. Mm -hmm. 
student. So appropriate. Yeah. All right, so Lisa, we're going to get to 9F in just a minute, but you would want to put that information in 9F. So we're going to spend a little time talking about alignment to Section 5 of the IEP. Mm -hmm. um, you can either take one goal that's already there and align it to education training. You could take another academic goal in Section 5, put language that, in, that would align to employment, and then have a functional one that can align to independent living, you could take one annual IEP goal that you already have and put language that aligns to all three domains. Mm -hmm. Either one of those is perfectly compliant and just fine. But what we encourage you to do is look at the IEP goals that you already have and add language to align them so that you're not reinventing the wheel or you know just coming up with a transition goal because don't that, that any goals that are in the IEP need to be aligned back to evaluations and aligned to services in section seven as well, right? Mm -hmm. You want to make sure that whatever goals you pick make sense. Mm -hmm. So this was a goal that was already in Dan's IEP and you can see it's about having conversations. So the IEP team put in language in preparation for college and career readiness and now there's alignment between section five of the IEP and section nine of the IEP. And you didn't have to reinvent the wheel. Mm -hmm. um, and it makes perfect sense that Dan would need to have conversations and collaborate with people if he's going to be um, successful in his chosen career of marketing or carpentry. Mm -hmm. We have a couple more examples just to show what we mean by that. So we have consultation, Dan is going to, um, this is a writing goal, he's writing informative essays. So it makes sense that if he's gonna work in marketing or carpentry, he should be able to write and, and problem solve and organize um, his writing. So the team added in preparation for working in marketing or carpentry to this particular goal because it made sense. Mm -hmm. Here's another example. Given social work services, this is about Dan being able to manage his anxiety, which is obviously hugely important. And you'll notice that this is a related service uh, goal. So it may be that during his social work se service sessions, he's working on some transition or functional life skills kind of stuff. So make sure to have conversations with your related service providers so that you can document what your students are doing. So. It makes sense. You got to manage your anxiety if you're going to be successful um, post-secondary. So adding that in preparation for a four-year college or university to study marketing or for work in the carpentry field and independent living. So you can see we've got all three domains in that one goal. I think there's one more example. So this is a speech and language goal. So Dan will have better success if he's intelligible. So he's working on intelligibility with his speech and language pathologist. And the team added in preparation for attending a four-year college or university to study marketing or in work in the carpentry field. So these were already in his IEP, language was added, now there's alignment. So that is fantastic. And I'd like to add at this point as well that we have many multilingual students as well, right, that also have I IEPs. And so it is very important to collaborate with not only their English teacher, but their multilingual teacher as well, so that we can fuse literacy across all subjects. So that it is not just an ELA goal, but what does literacy and accessing language look like in math? in science, in um, history. Um, how can we support our student in developing, developing the, his literacy skills and how that impacts the transition goal as well? So making sure that we are reaching out to our multilingual teachers and making sure that that discussion happens across all subjects, that it's not just an English goal, that we have that uh, multilingual support across all subjects. Perfect. And I think this is another one that you would like to speak to, the planned course of study. 
so uh, you, you start and then okay. and yes. when we okay. start showing them the dates. Perfect. The last All right. Time. Mm-hmm. So the planned course of study, this is where in 9E of the IEP, you actually plan out what classes the student will need to have in order to reach their post-secondary goals. And you project it out. So when you get the student as a ninth grader and they want to be an auto mechanic, then you look in your course catalog and look for electives that will help them reach that auto mechanics goal. And instead of saying ninth grade uh, or or 11th grade, you know, English, science, math, elective, 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 you're going to put in what the name of electives that will help them reach the post-secondary goals. If they change their mind in the next year and they don't want to be an auto mechanic, they want to be a photographer. And when you amend, uh, pardon me, don't amend. When you do the annual, just update that section to include a photography elective or, you know, whatever is going to help the student reach that goal at that time. And the procedural manual has some information um, on page 39. If you would like to look at it, there's one point. Yeah, so these should pass the stranger test. And I love that because it can anybody who comes into your classroom look at that course of study by itself and see what post secondary employment goal that kid has. That's what that means. So If it's, you know, photography, then make sure your electives are specific to that. Um, We have a question. Yes. Personal finance classes may be part of the service and placed in 9E. Uh, Yes, actually. So you can't, you would put that they're taking the class in 9E, but Mm -hmm. you would also put it in 9F as a service because it's something that um, is, is helping them educationally with the service. So we have an example here and you'll see um, we actually mm-hmm. have a financial math. Mm-hmm. So because Dan wants to be in marketing or carpentry, we tailored his electives to be towards those. So he's doing intro to business, carpentry one, carpentry two, etc. And then one point that I want to make we're not expecting so if you have the child as a freshman, we expect for you to do from ninth to whenever that child is gonna finish. And Titus will talk about that a little bit more. If for instance, you get a a child in who's a transfer student and the other district didn't list out their course of study or it's non-compliant for whatever reason, we are not expecting you to go through that child's files and find what classes they did before they came to you. You don't have time for that. So just take them where they are, where you have them and project out. And then write a little note in the written notice to talk about that, just in case there are any questions that come up. Absolutely. As far as the course of study is concerned, the earlier we start planning out, the better. We now have the eligibility through age 22. So the minute that student steps in your class and you start planning out what they, um, what is most appropriate for their schedule, how much they can um complete within one year. Maybe we have a student with such complex needs that they are going to focus on one strand um, before they tackle the STEM, the the math and um, science. And so we plan this out in such a way that we are um, ensuring that the student accesses the curriculum successfully. So they might not look at a standard four-year um, cohort. Maybe it's appropriate for them to take less classes because it will reinforce their learning and increase the opportunity for success. Maybe um, what would be most appropriate for them based on the IEP discussion and well documented in the written notice that we should start looking, uh, that we should develop a five or six year um, uh, course of study for them versus the tr- traditional four, uh, four. but remember, it must be appropriate for that individual student. We're not doing it for all students. We are looking for students with those complex needs that would truly 
um, benefit from an extended year or two, not all students. So another piece here is if a child, uh, if a student becomes credit deficient. So what if Dan doesn't pass World History One? When you update the annual, you do not have to amend. You can bring World History One down to 10th grade if that's when he's taking it. And then you can put credit recovery or something like that next to it so that um, the team understands that that's what's happening. Um, for, for students who you know are going to have um, eligibility past 12th grade, you could consider doing the years instead of 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th. You could do 22, 23, 20, uh, 23, 24, et cetera, down. Um, you could just number them. Um, so they're, we're, we're not married to having the grades specifically there as long as it's delineated out in some way. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. And making sure that the course of study in this conversation is um, noted on the written notice. So Absolutely. that's part of the conversation because some parents would come to the fourth year and say, we never discussed and then asking for a fifth or sixth year when this course of study was discussed. So this is really a CYA, making sure that you discuss it and review each year and the requirements with the parent. Thank you. All right, I'm not seeing anything in the chat box. I mean, new, sorry. All right, 9F. 9F is the bane of my existence. So if you look at the prompt for 9F, Describe the activities provided by the adults in the school and the community that will enable and promote the child's progress towards meeting annual and post-secondary goals. So this is where you would put special education, general education, related services, services from other agencies, service provided by families. Um, this is where you would also put that, finan uh, that personal finance class because that's um, transition related as well. So we're documenting the service and activities that occur during the life of the IEP that are provided by the adult in the school and the community, but we're not going to take the other ones off. And I'm going to show you examples, so don't worry. So these are not will statements because they're provided by the adult in the community. Our guidance, and I'll show you examples, is to do a bulleted list. They shouldn't include anything past the life of this IEP. So if the child is a freshman, you wouldn't put in activities that they're going to do in their junior year. And we advise to leave the previous services on because that shows movement. This is from the procedural manual and it just talks about, you know, um, services. Do they need transportation services? Are they getting transportation services? Um, what kind of instruction are they getting? What kind of related services are they getting? Um, those are all things that can be put in 9F. And here is an example of the education one. And you can see that we put the years in parentheses and we just keep adding to them unless it's something like the financial math that he just took once and then it's just there. But we add and we never take off because, because of that movement piece. You want these, by the time the child gets to their last year of high school, this should be a big section. It should be um, very detailed. Um, so some career employment. This is from the procedural manual as well. Registering to vote. I never thought about putting that in the IEP, but why not? Uh, filing taxes, knowing how to rent a home, the medical service piece that um, Titus talked about. And Titus, can you talk about the social security piece as well? Absolutely. So um, we know that there are many parents that are hesitant um, to have their, their scholar actually work and earn because it might affect their SSI or SSDI. One way of combating this or supporting our students' um, opportunity um, for employment during high school is to ensure that we engage our parents. 
One way of doing that with SSI and SSDI is by inviting our CWICs. Um, CWICs are individuals that would help you, help the family determine what that cap number is, right? Because we want to do no harm. So as the case manager, you don't want to speak to SSI or SSDI, but you can have the professionals come in and do a query with um, your student and the family. So um, when there are opportunities for family engagement, I would encourage you to reach out to the CWICs and have them come and um, present um, the, the information around SSI and SSDI uh, to the families so that there's a clear understanding of what that cap should be or how it might impact their benefits. Perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So some other career employment, the job seeking and job keeping skills, job shadowing, advisory programs, internships. Those are all ideas that can be in this section as well. And what I'd also encourage our uh, case managers as well is to invite the Chamber of Commerce or attend a Chamber of Commerce uh, meeting greet where we can find what the community actually needs so that you know um, what opportunities are out there for your scholars to participate in um, work experience or job shadow as well. So making a very, um, I'd like to make a very strong case of um, the school to really get involved in um, or really reach out to their chambers of commerce because that is a untapped source of opportunity for your students to gain um, employment experience. All right. So here is an example of Dan. In fact, I need to take this slide out. Here's the one from the IEP. So you can see that for his career employment and other post-secondary adult living objectives, he did a career interest inventory in marketing and carpentry. He participated in career prep activities through the advisor advisory program, and he job shadowed individuals in both carpentry and marketing. So when we talk about community experience, it could be recreational, volunteer, a college or career fair, or other community-based experiences. But we need to ask ourselves, how are our students able to engage in the community? Can they do it independently? Do they need family support? Do they need community support? Or is there a paid agency involved that's gonna take them and do that work with them? Mm -hmm. And this is an opportunity for you as well to engage with your VR counselor, and they can help you set up um, opportunities um, in the community as well. Yeah, Liz, some of the assessments, absolutely, you can put those in 9F as well, sure. Yeah, because those are, those are driving and those are, um, those are things that you have provided as the adult, absolutely, yep. So we have Dan's example here. He volunteered at a marketing business. He's currently employed with satisfactory employment evaluations and he's in the Boy Scouts. So think about those families that might attend church. Um, there might be a youth group that the child goes to, um, you know, or things like that, that the family is doing that could go under the community experience that um, but they're already involved in. Don't, don't miss out on those. Um, so more examples, banking, shopping, transportation, recreation, those are other, other um, pieces that we can look at for those community experiences as well. And it's on page, those are on pages 40 to 41 of the procedural manual. The next slide is a duplicate. I need to take it out. Okay. Daily living skills. So some ideas for daily living skills, preparing meals. You know, maybe they have one day a week that they, you know, make supper at home or something like that, you know, work with the families. Budgeting, maintaining a home, knowing, you know, when is it time to clean the bathroom, things like that. Um, and caring for themselves, clothing, pets, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Titus. So when speaking to daily living skills, it's also about time management. So making sure that, um, 
but to help each team can maybe develop what a, a, a day would look like at school. But then if they were not at school, what would their day be like at home? So developing a, um, supporting daily living skills by helping them develop uh, schedules are one um, is an assignment that um, truly speaks to uh, daily living skills. But remember, these um, daily living skills, although it's applicable to all students, it, it might not necessarily be appropriate for your uh, for that particular student that you are working with. But um, daily living skills is not only about um, not only about time management, but we also have to look at health needs when mm -hmm. speaking to day, daily living skills. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, I just found another typo. Mm -hmm. Financial match class. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so this is Dan's example. So you can see that he did the financial math class to learn money management. And he's the primary caregiver for the family dog. You know, that's something going on in the home already, but it's a functional life skill. And it's one that Dan takes care of. And it really speaks to that good open communication with the family and, and being able to use that information. And how they can use technology to support that as well. Very good. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So site services, um, working with um, the assistive technology that can support and prompt your students as well to be successful throughout the day is something that should be included and discussed. Perfect. All right, we're going to move on to 9G of the IEP. So if you are, as the district, if you are inviting an outside agency to um, an IEP meeting with transition is discussed, you need to make sure that you have parental consent to invite those folks prior to inviting them. So, and that consent is needed, signed consent is needed every time you have the meeting where you invite them. It's not a one and done at the beginning of the year. And of course, a caveat to that is the parent can invite whoever they would like to, to the IEP team meeting. So we're going to show you some documentation in just a second. So here we have 9G, the vocational rehabilitation folks, great, mm -hmm. um, or NA. Please don't leave it blank. Please, I beg of you, don't leave it blank because you've put so much work into this plan up to this point. Mm -hmm. it, it can be wonderful, but if this is blank, so please just don't leave it blank. Mm -hmm. If the parents invite someone, this is one way you could choose to document that. So this is the written notice who's, in, who's been at the meeting. So you can see that Mr. Purple, the vocational rehabilitation counselor was invited by the parents. So if we're monitoring for compliance and we see that, we're not gonna look back in the file and look for that parental consent. Mm -hmm. So, a big piece of the transition plan is making sure that it is documented in the written notice. This is one way to do it. It's not the only way to do it. So just keep that in mind. Um, but just having that, you know, in section one, that it was updated, reviewed, and accepted, and then putting some detailed information in the written notice as well. Um, you know, what was done during the year? What, what does this transition look like now? What's updated? Um, and what is, what is he going to be doing over the life of this IEP? Mm -hmm. And making sure that um, all the agencies that you have invited as well, that it uh, is detailed over here. That, Absolutely. Um, yeah. Yes, whether it's the CTE teacher, whether it's the service provider, whether it's VR, don't try and collectively refer to them, detail each agency and what they what you want to discuss with each agent as well so it's clear going forward anybody that is looking at IP um, after the fact will know who discussed what um, at the meeting perfect so section 10 of the IEP looks at the age of majority so this should be completed at or before the IEP meeting that the child turns 17 
This state obviously doesn't change. And this is where you're gonna talk to the student and the parents about the transfer of rights at the age of 18, unless there have been other arrangements made, because we know that some of our students have very significant, um, you know, more significant disabilities and they may not be their own guardian. So mm -hmm. um, this is that section. But it's also speaking and informing both the, the student and, and the parent um, regarding requirements that they will have if they are applying for waiver services. So at this point, with with age of majority coming up, we'll know um, the uh, triannual. Right? Does it include the violin? The uh, violin? Does it include the um, IQ? Like all the things that is going to be required by ODES to be determined eligible. So this is when having this conversation around age of majority. It will also behoove um, the IEP team to review the uh, particular waivers that might be. Um, in, um, supporting assessments that is going to be required to apply for eligibility. Very important. Okay, so this is the indicator again. We already talked about all of these things. I'm not gonna spend any time on it. Some takeaways from today, please have your transition plans be student-centered as much as possible. That family engagement piece is very important. Assessments are huge. Students should be encouraged to attend their meetings and then that piece about the outside agencies. I am pretty sure we got all of this information. Okay. All right. So one thing that I would like Titus to talk about because I was so excited and then we will let you go after Carly talks about the QR code is Vogue Rehab and their pre ed services. So um, vocational rehabilitation. Um, I know there's um, a lot of staff shortages. However, if you are unable to contact your local VR counselor, you can call the regional VR and they can help you um, answer any of the questions you may have. If you have difficulty having um, getting a response from them, please reach out to me and I can help you get into contact with someone that can support your school or your district. But I want everyone to understand that pre-ETS, okay, these are employment transition services. Previously, you had to have parents' consent um, for these services, but um, it I would encourage you to still get that, but apparently it's not a required any longer. You can work with your local um, vocational rehabilitation counselor um, and have them come in once or twice a month, depending on the needs of your school. I used to have um, the VR counselor come in twice a month bi-weekly for my 9th and 10th um, students and then my 11th and 12th uh, students. So. Um, and this, and they had a period every Friday morning to discuss and um, uh, engage in pre-ETS services. So we don't have to wait until the 11th and 12th grade to determine eligibility. We can have those VR counselors involved in the students' development of their ETS skills. Um, from the very beginning in ninth and 10th, and not only keeping that to the end of their high school career. So the more they are able to grapple and uh, participate in VR support, the VR agent will know how to support them 11th and 12th going forward as well. So kind of closing that loop and not letting it um, open-ended because that VR counselor is also going to travel with that student post-secondary. So the longer we can develop that relationship, the more the, the VR um, counselor will know how to support that student, especially when we're talking about um, uh, assistive technology. So if they can identify what that assistive technology need is in nine and 10, the student can then practice using that tool for um, 
for the duration of being at high school and they prepare to use that post-secondary. But VR can also help that student get funds for that AT if it's very expensive, but it does not necessarily mean that it's only like high level assistive technology, but also small ways and small um, non-expensive assistive technology that can support your student uh, post-secondary. Thank you, so, to sum them up, we can get VR involved much earlier than we used to be able to. So ninth, 10th, reach out to the VR counselors. Yeah, reach out to them. And if you if you have issues even reaching the regional program, um, Titus can help you with that. And her mm -hmm. information, as you remember, um, was at the beginning of our um, of our PowerPoint today. Mm -hmm. So this could potentially be, you know, folks coming into your classroom and um, and doing some of this work with your kids and giving you a little break. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Titus. You just put it in the chat box for us. Um, so this is more information about that. And there's their contact information. And the rest are just online resources. So if you are somebody who gets car sick, please look away because I'm going to go to the end and Carly's going to come on and talk about a QR code. So these are all resources there for you. All the links are good. Um, hurts my heart a little bit that I'm not getting into in more detail. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. But if you need specific assessments or a specific tool for your student and you can't find it and it, um, you need to make sure that it's appropriate and leveled, just reach out to me as well. And we can... Uh, refine and guide you to assessments that um, can support your students. You are not alone. Um, and Titus is going to be joining us for office hours on the 8th of February. We're going to be talking about um, eligibility to age 22 and transition plans then. Mm -hmm. So Carly put in the feedback link. Here are resources that we include, the professional development calendar and all that kind of fun stuff. Carly, can you come on and talk about this, please? Yes, absolutely. So this is our feedback and contact hour form, and the link is in the chat, or you can use your mobile device and do the QR code. Um, it takes you to the same place. So we just have a few questions that we ask because we like to get feedback about our professional development and how we can make it better or what your needs are, what you're looking for. Um, so if you could fill that out, that would be great. And then there's a second portion where you get your contact hour. So you'll be asked to select the training, and today's training is the B13 training, and then you'll be prompted to pick, pick which one, because there was one in October, but this is the 11723 B13 training. Mm -hmm. So select that so that you get the correct contact hour and the correct copy of uh, the PowerPoint will come to you. Um, and you'll also get a copy of our office hours, the IEP quick reference document, the procedural manual, and music. Mm -hmm. like party favors we're just giving yes. them out left and right for you guys and be like, careful when stuff. you type your email just make sure it's spelled correctly so all of those great party favors get to you <laughs> i also want to mention if you want more in-depth transition support um, i host the transition tuesdays power hour at three o'clock if there are any uh, specific questions or topics that you would like me to uh, review with you either individually or um present um on a tuesday please reach out no question around transition too big or too small okay please reach out um you have our contact information um please reach out to us with questions we're happy to answer them um and if you need anything just just let us know thank you for joining us today and thank, thank you, you titus we're oh, so excited yeah. to have you <laughs> Thank you. I love working with your team. All right. So we will see you guys at another time. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Of course. Thank you.